Welcome to Inside Europe's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and tonight our guest is one of America's most respected realist painters, whose inspiration has been the streets of New York for over 60 years. Some call him the Isaac Basheva singer of the painting world because of his honest vision and ability to capture the beauty of human nature. Are you no, react I, to that? A very warm welcome to you, Raphael thank you Sawyer. Very much. Can I see a thank you. quizzical response mm -hmm. to that introduction? Uh, yes, I have a I quizzical know that response, Mr. yes. Yes. This is the first time that I was called the Isaac Bashevis singer <laughs> of, of painting. And I really don't think uh, there is any um, similarity or any relationship at all. I always was a um, non-parochial painter and I painted only what I saw in my neighborhood in New York City which I call my country rather than my city but uh, I must stress again that uh, this is the very first time that I was called the Isaac Bashevis singer in painting. Actually several critics have referred to you that way. Did they know? Yes. Now that I know, probably I don't read too much of the criticism. I don't have a great opinion of the, of the critical writing in this country. And I may have uh, uh, neglected to read this particular thing. How important is the work of a critic to an artist? Um, uh, well, in my life, uh, the critics were not terribly important. As far as I'm concerned, as far as my work was concerned, no, they were not very. I never paid uh, attention to critics, and I always worked my uh, the way I wanted to, the way I chose to, for better or for worse. And if I had to listen to critics, I don't know what would have happened to my work. Well, a great deal has happened to your work, and you tell us about it in considerable detail in your own memoirs and in numerous books that have been written about you. Why don't we begin at some of the beginning and refer to your memoirs where you tell us of your early life in Russia, a childhood of delight in art and in literature, but fraught with frustrations. At a very early age, your family was expelled from Russia, and you emigrated to the United States when I believe you were 13. 12. Oh, 12. What were the circumstances of the departure? Well, uh, I would like to call at this moment attention to my book called The Diary of an Artist, where all this is described in great detail. At this moment, I really can't... Um, clearly you recall, I mean, just exactly what happened. I know that my father was very much involved with the student uh, population of the city we came from, Borisovlevsk, that was the name of the city. And uh, uh, he um, somehow was involved with some of the um, uh, progressive students. And in the Tsarist Russia, that was a, an offense. And, and also because we were Jewish people, and uh, Jewish uh, people didn't have much uh, uh, citizenship at that time in Tsarist Russia. And they were, uh, my parents were told to leave the country. I mean, it, it was uh, something what they called uh, Pravo Zhitelstvo in Russian, that means the right to live that uh, Jewish people in that Russian town had, the Russian town where we came from. There was a very small population of, uh, uh, of, of Jew Jewish people there, and uh, they were very Russianized, but they all had to have something called the right to live. And they took away from my father this document, the right to live, and he had to live. Russia. And uh, we came to this country, like many, many people in those days who emigrated or immigrated into this country. 
Was it not rather unusual for you and members of your family to be so involved, even at such an early age, with In art? art? Yes. Yes, I think it was. Uh, because, uh, but uh, as I said before, my father was the intellectual of that town. Uh, and uh, he uh, was um, very much interested in literature and in art, in Russian literature and Hebrew literature, and he loved art. And he uh, encouraged us, you know, all children draw when they're children, uh, all people draw when they're children. And uh, he encouraged us to draw and we pursued this. Uh, and uh, he himself drew a little bit. And that's how we became involved in art at a very early age. And how did you uh, first... Three, be three brothers. I and my two brothers. How did you first become involved with drawing from life? Uh, yes, that's a very interesting story, too. That's also in my book. I mean, uh, uh, that... Uh, well, perhaps uh, you would tell us for uh, those of us who do not young, yet have your book. Well, yes, but maybe don't get it now and read it, because then it's in, in detail. But uh, it happened that uh, a neighbor of ours, a young man, a Russian uh, the, um, young man whose name was Ivan Ivanovich, that means Ivan, Ivan, the son of Ivan. And he also loved to draw, kind of a, in a very, um, well, self-taught way, you know. And uh, uh, he knew, he became acquainted with my father. And one day he asked him, to pose for him. And he came and he drew my father. Made a large, large drawing. I still remember it. It looked like kind of a Russian icon. Had the quality of it. And, um, and to me it was a revelation because I never saw anybody draw a living person because children draw from imagination. And this is how I became very much interested in drawing from life. And uh, several, uh, I was so impressed by the drawing of Ivan Ivanovich's that uh, for a while I didn't draw. And then I asked my father to pose for me like he did for this young man. And I made the drawing from life, the first drawing from life of my father. And the drawing was praised. And from that time on, I drew from life. Didn't draw like a child anymore from imagination which I think is unfortunate because somehow I did not um, develop my imagination as even today, although I know how to draw, I know how to draw a human figure. I mean, I still rely a great deal upon life, upon working from life, from people. When you came to this country, your family moved to the Bronx, where you stayed for about five years before you move to Manhattan yourself. As you refer to it, it is your country, not only your city, it is your country, New York yes, City. Yes, uh, New York City is where I lived you know, from childhood, from 12 years on. I went to, other, other, to many other places, but I always returned to New York because the, New York has the quality. I mean, New York and I kind of are a part, a part of one another, mm -hmm. I can say that. When first you came, uh, you were not an artist except by night. Except? By night, when you attended art school. Uh, yes. What were the circumstances of your well, early training? Uh, I went to school for a while. I went to public school. I graduated public school. I went for a year, about a year and a half to high school. And then, of course, we were a very large family, many ch six children, father and mother, also a grandmother. And sooner or later, I had to go to work. And uh, I worked during the day, and I went to art school, to Cooper Union, my first art school. I went at night. And uh, that's it. What did you do during the day? I worked. Jobs, all, all sorts of jobs. Later on, uh, I worked in factories. I worked as a messenger boy. I worked as a newspaper uh, seller. Yeah, all those things. All the jobs that one had in the 19, or well, before the 1920s, which were, uh, you know, the kind, of the characteristic jobs. I mean, that many people of my uh, generation uh, had in those days. 
You were a teacher for many generations as well, and your work is well, known. Um, well, of course, later on I became a teacher. I mean, after uh, when I had my second one-man exhibition, I was invited to teach at the Art Students League, and I taught there for several years. In those days, they'd invite teachers to. They'd invite the artists to teach at the League. It Who were your colleagues when school. you were there? When I was there, uh, my colleagues were um, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, uh, Alexander Brook, um, let's see, I don't remember anymore. I mean, shortly before I came there, there were, um, there was my teacher there, Guy Pen Dubois, there was Max Weber, and uh, all the painters who taught there at that time had reputations, and that's why I consider the great honor to be invited to teach at the Arts Students League. <laughs> Are there any experiences you had while you were a teacher there that are particularly striking that you'd like to share with us, either among your students or with your colleagues? Uh, no, nothing particularly. Uh, some of the students I'm still in contact with. There were some very, in those days the art schools were different from the art schools of today. Uh, many, uh, most of the students were very young people. I mean, they were so-called the professional art students and they had uh, hopes of becoming artists, full-fledged artists with reputations and, and so forth. Today's schools are different. I mean, of course, there are some young people there, but also a great number of middle-aged people and elderly people who have leisure now, and uh, they come there for uh, just to um, past time and to, for therapeutic reasons and also for enjoyment. I mean, but there are more elderly people today in arts, art classes than there were at the, when I was a teacher. There were young people. I remember when I was a student at the academy, the, uh, there were no older people there at all. Everybody was young and we were all kind of neurotic and, uh, and uh, uh, had great uh, hopes uh, to become artists and even thought in terms of immortality and so on. Are you suggesting that current uh, yeah, painting school uh, I, classes I, uh, or art schools are filled with... What I'm that is that art schools have changed. I mean, they're not like they used to be. And we, cho we, we choose our teachers because of their reputations. I liked the man and Guy Pen Dubois, and I became his student. And that one would then choose an art school because they intended to make art their life and their livelihood. That's right, absolutely, yes. When did you decide to do that? To make, uh, well... <clears throat> so it certainly wasn't the usual to, way to earn a living. Uh, well, I didn't think uh, in, in terms of earning a living, but I, I, I always thought or hope to become an artist. I, I thought in terms of becoming an artist. This earning a living never never, never um, bothered me till very much later. It was kind of a very romantic idea to become an artist for a long time in my childhood, in my youth. Only much later did I begin to think in terms of making a living. Well, you were raised in an environment where that was a possible way of life. As you mentioned, your three brothers were all involved in art. And I guess we are most familiar with Moses, Moses and, and Isaac. Isaac. Yes. Was having that kind of family environment a help or a hindrance to you? Did you help each other in your explorations in art? Was that a supportive experience? Well, uh, no, there was, first of all, my brother Moses is my twin brother, was my twin brother, and we always had a kind of a struggle for identity, for uh, we, each one wanted to be himself. And that was a big problem because we looked alike, and there was a family likeness in, in the work we did, and uh, therefore we really had a struggle to become, each one to become himself. And from uh, very early, Moses and I decided to go to different art schools, to have different studios, not, not to have a studio together. And, uh, and we 
I think we succeeded in becoming each one himself. <coughs> Excuse me, each one himself. As far as the hindrance <coughs> or um, the opposite, well, there was, uh, uh, you know, there was this uh, struggle or this uh, sibling rivalry always from child to aunt. Each one uh, wanted to be better than the other one. And that's a great, um, I should say, it's a kind of torturous kind of uh, feeling that never subsides. Uh, but we also profited by showing one another uh, his, uh, his work and uh, criticize one another very severely sometimes and we learned from one another a great deal. Your work is known not only for the quality of the painting but for its psychological acumen. What can you tell us about humanity after having observed it so closely for so long? Well, I can't tell very much about humanity. I don't know, it's too much, too, too big a subject to talk to. But I attribute this, uh, this um, psychological element, you said, in my work, I attribute, it, I attribute it to the fact that I was actually, well, I have three cultures. I have the Russian culture, I have the Jewish culture, and I have the American culture. And these three cultures, I think, uh, combined, uh, uh, creates this, um, this, especially the, the Russian, the Russian. Just one moment. Fire engines in the street. Yeah. Perhaps you could talk a bit uh, uh, well, louder. I'll begin it lower again. Please. This, uh, you were telling us that you have three this, cultures. Uh, I think it might help if we just look that It's uh, psychological. Is that better? The psychological element that is uh, in my work, I attribute to uh, the three cultures that I, I uh, have, the Russian, the Jewish, and the American. And especially the Russians are great psychologists. I mean, if you know their literature and their painting, they always looked deeply into the so-called, the soul, I mean, if you know the Russian literature. <clears throat> and um, from childhood on, I read everything that my father had in his library. Uh, and when we came to this country, actually, it's the Russian. Uh, we read an awful lot of Russian because Yiddish, I learned here in this country. We studied some Hebrew when we were in Russia, but our mother tongue was Russian. And I, I read everything at the age, I came here at the age of 12. But um, uh, till that age, I've read everything that my father read. And it's, of course, it's Chekhov and Gorky and Dostoevsky and uh, so on, Gogol. And they're all were, uh, psych I would call them psychological writers. I mean, they delved very deeply into the human psyche. And uh, I think it's, uh, I, um, and this, think of my uh, insight into the human psyche is part of that environment, part of my childhood. You have lived and worked in New York you City. Know, I, I just want to say something else. <clears throat> now, um, uh, when I, very often, you know, when I think of the American artists, like uh, even uh, Hopper, or Scheeler, Charles Scheeler, George O'Keefe. Uh, I call them the aristocrats of the so-called indigenous American art. The so-called aristocrats of the indigenous American art. When you see an exhibition of these men and others people like Niall Spencer and so on, there is a kind of a, uh, a lack of humanism. There, uh, there's a kind of a prophylactic quality about their work. I mean, their houses, their clean streets, their architectural things, and even Hopper, when he paints, there may be a, maybe one figure, maybe. There's all, it's like a desert. There are hardly any people there. Now, uh, I'm a different kind of an artist. I paint people. To me, the people are the important uh, subject. Of I can my recall art. some of your early work 
where you were also that kind of a painter, where many street uh, scenes were painted. No, I painted street scenes, but there are always people there. There are always kind of, uh, uh, you know, I painted, for instance, some side streets of New York City, and uh, where only the bums used to gather. And I painted them there, lying in the sun or in the sh shade, but uh, they were always inhabited. My streets were always inhabited. I never painted just a street, um, uh, like, say, uh, Charles Sheeler would paint. When he paints a factory, for instance, and I, don't, I think they're very great artists. Now he paints a factory, at, uh, he did paint factories. There's never a human being in the factory. He paints the, the outside of it or the, um, the machinery of it, but never the human being. And the same thing with, uh, with the other artists. And they're always so clean and so meticulous, and almost prophylactic. It's unlike the pictures I do. And I think this is the way I do add something to American art, my way, my addition. You talk about their colors. Your palette, of course, is very distinctive. Those blues, those ever-present blues, a subtle palette that is often subdued uh, well, uh, and actually chromatically unified and very carefully controlled, whether it is that notion that you describe of... Well, I, I have a very, very simple palette. I have very few colors on my palette. And some artists come to my studio and they look at my palette and they're amazed there's so few colors there. Because too many uh, different colors um, confuse me. And I um, am satisfied with just those few colors. I do, I mix them uh, and I do get the results I want. And uh, once in a while I try some different pigment and I, uh, it confuses me. What are the colors that you and they're use? They're basic uh, colors. They're yellow ochre, white, black, blue, uh, burnt sienna, uh, green. That's it. I use, I use practically one uh, yellow, yellow ochre. I don't use the other yellows, which is unusual. Also, um, I do have to get once in a while I remember a, 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 mo a uh, time when I had to get cerulean blue because I had to paint Isaac Bashevis Singer's eyes and they're very, very blue. And uh, that's again to go back to Isaac Bashevis Singer. To, to paint his eyes, I actually had to buy a tube of cerulean blue. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a, self, a portrait of you. And I well, assume that is his a, yes, only existing yes, artwork. Oh, yes, he did the drawing of me. In the 30s and 40s, you painted troubled times, uncertainties of the Depression and World War II, and in the 50s and 60s, you gave us life in the East Village, Vietnam protesters and flower children. Now, many of the people that you paint are dressed in blue jeans. Yes. Is it what they symbolize or the color that lures you? Well, no, I always... Uh painted what I saw. In the Depression day, uh, days, I saw people sitting and brown, they, uh, they, were, they were kind of uh, dressed very uh, dingily, and uh, the colors were dingy, so, and uh, they were sitting in parks, or lying down somewhere in parks, and I painted them. I always relied upon my eyes. Later on, I was um, in uh, on Second Avenue. That was in the 60s, I guess. And uh, on Second Avenue, that was East Village at that time. And I got to know many young artists there and many young poets and writers. And I painted them. Now I'm on Columbus Avenue and uh, uptown. And I see all these people dressed in jeans. I also, at the time they wore uh, mini skirts, I painted them in mini skirts. I paint what I see. I paint what I see. Many of the people you paint are personal friends or well-known personalities. Yes, right. How do you select right. your subjects and what is the method mm -hmm. by which you work? Yes, well, I like to paint people. I like, again, uh, coming back to this uh, element of 
psychology of look, uh, uh, looking deeply into the, the human being. I like some of the people. I mean, I know people. I know many artists. And I paint them because I know them and I love to paint them. And uh, I paint my wife, my daughter, and um, my friends. Uh, but I, uh, when I was young, I painted commissions. I did many portraits of men, uh, women, and children especially for money. In those days, if I'd get $25, $50, $75, $100, I'd paint these people for money, but I never enjoyed it. I never, I never loved to do that because it always inhibited my style. It always made me, uh, it curtailed me. I mean, I, I wasn't as free as I am when I paint uh, people I know and, uh, and, and, and they're not commissions. I paint to please myself. When I did those commissions, I had to please the mother of the child or the, the husband of the wife and so on. Are the subjects often pleased no matter who paints them? Hmm? Are subjects often pleased no matter who paints them? Are they pleased? No, not, uh, no, I don't think uh, people who have their portraits painted, I mean, commission artists to paint their portraits, I don't believe they're always pleased by the, by the art. As a matter of fact, I, just today I was reading about Kokoschka, uh, you know that famous painter, and he painted a wonderful portrait of a, uh, an old s scientist. I think his name was 4L. That man with the beard and his wonderful hands, and they neither he nor the family liked the portrait. And it's one of the masterpieces of, of uh, European art, of modern European art, if you know which one I mean. So that, uh, no, commissions are not always accepted by, the, uh, by those who commission the portraits. Have you ever had that experience? Have a commission had, rejected? Uh, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. No, but I can tell very funny stories about some of those commissions. <coughs> Shall I go into it? Please. It's just a little funny. Well, for instance, I painted a woman once, and uh, she had the longish nose. And then she changed her nose, <laughs> and she wanted me to repaint the portrait, something like that. Another man, I painted a man once Did in you? a while. No, I said I'm not a, what do you call it, a plastic surgeon. Uh, plastic surgeon, surgeon. Or whatever. excuse me, sir. And then it happened that I um, painted a, a middle-aged man. He just came from Florida, so on vacation. No, no. When I painted him, he was kind of very haggard and very uh, <laughs> unhappy looking or didn't feel well. And then he went to, I painted him and it was accepted. And then uh, when he came back from Florida, he was fat and brown. And he said, you know, Mr. Sawyer, when uh, my, the portrait you did of me is right above my, above the sofa where I usually sit when, um, uh, when guests come. And they always say, hey, what's the matter with you, Charlie? Were you sick when you, uh, when you posed? <laughs> and he came with the portrait and wanted me to um, repaint it, make him fat, as he said, kind of uh, prosperous looking. And I said, no, I won't. That's, that's it. When was your first exhibition in New York, and what were the circumstances that uh, surrounded yes. that? Well, my first exhibition was in 1929. And I was friendly with, with my uh, instructor at the Art Students League. And after I left the school, I still would come um, and see him and show him my work. And one day I brought him a painting and he said, if you'll take this painting to the Daniel Galleries and tell them that I sent you there, and tell them that I sent you there. And I did that. I took that picture over to the Daniel Galleries and they told me that if I'll have 12 such pictures, they'll give me a one-man show. And uh, it took me a year to make 12 pictures like that, because at that time I still worked during the day, and I painted only weekends, and I had a one-man show. And the Daniel Galleries at that time was a very well-known gallery, and... Um, uh, Who were the some, other artists uh, the that other were exhibited artists in were that gallery? Artists, Kuniyoshi. Uh, Peter Bloom, uh, 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 what's his name, Ma jo John Marin, 
and then Al Spencer and also Pasquin. So it was quite an accomplishment uh, for yes, a very young man. it was quite a big thing for me to be in that gallery. And, and what happened to your career from that point on? Well, from that point on, I uh, considered myself an artist. And I began to get studios, first with some friends, and then my own studio. You've had many studios around the city. Oh, all over New York City. First along the waterfront? I used to, I love the waterfront both east and west, before these uh, high uh, highways were. were uh, I watched uh, building the, uh, the east uh, highway and also the west highway. And I painted some pictures of that, uh, uh, of, the, of the process of, of building some of those things. I don't know what those pictures are. Where is your studio now and how often do you go there? My studio now is um, Columbus Avenue. It's 50, uh, off Columbus Avenue on 74th Street. It's uh, 54 West 74. In an office and building. And I go there every day. In an office building, so to speak. Uh, no, that was a building where many artists lived and worked at one time or another. It was a studio building, but now people live there. And they have uh, converted their uh, the studios into homes. Some of them are very nice, very big, large rooms. And, uh, but I, I think I'm the only artist left there, about the only artist left there, who just uses it as a studio. How often do you go? How often? All the time. All the time. I go there, as my wife says, we go, uh, some people ask her, does Mr. Sauer go to the studio every day? She says, yes, every day, including Christmas and Yom Kippur. <laughs> you have described yourself as a museum fiend, which is rather unusual for an artist, that you make museum pilgrimages yeah. all over the world. Can you describe some of them and to the work of what artists do you most respond? Well, again, those descriptions are in my book, but um, and the artists I respond to are the um, the great artists, I mean, the great classical artists, the great traditional painters. I mean, of course, you, you, you think of Rembrandt, you think of um, Courbet, of uh, Degas, of the Flemish painters, Van der Weyden, Van Eyck. All these painters had uh, 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 the American painter, Thomas Aikens. These are the painters that have influenced me in my work. I mean, they are m my painters. Is there the work of any artist that is always in your head when you yourself paint? Uh, the work of any artist? Yes, there's always some, uh, some artist in back of my head when I paint. Yes. Is there anyone uh, specific? Yes, yeah, specifically I think Degas, Thomas Aikens, Corot, Courbet. I mean, these are the people that are always uh, in, in my mind when I approach a canvas. But of course... Is it I, form? I, is it color? I, what is it about their work that so uh, the, engages you? Know, the, you? The, the work is their, uh, I think again, the, the hu human quality in the work. They're interested in people, they're interested in human beings. That's the thing that always attracts me, you see. Hum Tremendous interest in the human face or in the human body, a human gesture, in, in the human being in context, within the context of his life. You have painted throughout the city for more than 60 years, as we've referred. What about the city continues to nourish you as an aesthetic environment? Again, the people there, the people of the city, the people of New York. We were just came back from Los Angeles, for instance. People don't walk there. You don't see people walking. They're always in cars. Here, the, this city teems with people. And then I watch those people. When I walk now along Columbus Avenue, I watch, at the, I, watch I, I look at the men and the women there. I study their gestures. Every once in a while, an idea occurs to me, gee, I'm going to make a painting. I'll call it Columbus Avenue. Or when I walk on the uh, on, uh, when I walked on Sixth Avenue once, 
several years ago, an idea occurred to me. Uh, now, it's called Avenue of the Americas. That's a wonderful title for a painting. And I painted the picture, which I call Avenue of the Americas. But actually, they're all the same, Columbus Avenue, Avenue of the Americas. They're people, and the facades of houses are, are secondary. Do you ever paint out of doors? I paint landscapes, yes, landscapes out of doors. Do you continue to do that? I haven't done it for some time, but uh, when we had, uh, in Maine, I painted in Maine and Massachusetts quite a few landscapes, but I haven't shown them very much. You made reference to the work of Charles Sheeler before, and it's rather antiseptic uh, quality. Of course, Sheeler was a photographer yeah. as well. Do you ever employ the use of photography in any of your work? No, never. I paint directly from life. I can't see those photorealists. I can't. I can't see them. I cannot see them. When you say you cannot see them, what I do you mean? I don't appreciate them. I don't uh, like them. I mean, I don't like their work. <clears throat> I don't know how they do it, even. I don't know. Well, it just does not interest me, because the personality of the artist is not there. It's the camera. It's, it's not even the human eye. It's, it's the eye of the camera that does the work, most of the work. There are several other schools of painting that do not interest you very much as well. In fact, that is a rather charitable way of putting it. Uh, no, that's not a charitable I just am not, I'm, I don't uh, detest them. I don't decry them. But uh, the fact is they do not, in, it does not interest me. I'm now referring to another school of painting, and that is, uh, for so long, yourself and other distinguished social realist painters. I wouldn't call myself a social realist. I mean, a I am a representational painter. painter. I, I paint representationally. I mean, realism again became kind of a word that they play with too much. But I paint, I represent things. I see something. I, and I represent it on the canvas. Is that how you would describe your work? I would describe myself as representational as against the non-representational painter. Well, there was a period when you and other of your colleagues uh, were almost invisible in terms of the critical community. And there was a point in the 1950s that you felt that art was not the preserve of a handful, and you called a meeting of a number of other artists. Can you tell us some of the circumstances of that meeting uh, and that period? Well, that was uh, during the ascent or the advent of the abstract expressionism, uh, of abstract expressionism, where uh, there was something like a concerted effort on the part of the critics, museums, uh, and, and the so-called cognoscenti to um, put it over, I mean, just to put it over. And they did a wonderful job. Overnight, they became all these people whom I knew. My, actually, they were my uh, contemporaries. All these people became geniuses overnight. And um, the other artists were kind of neglected. And um, you heard only about these abstract expressionists all the time, and there was tremendous kind of uh, uh, approval of them on the part of all these people. And uh, what some, uh, well, some other contemporaries of mine would meet me in the street and say, what's happening to art? What's, what's taking place now? Look, look at all these uh, abstract, uh, all these uh, artists who became so famous while we are kind of forgotten. Well, I said, it's not, a, it's not a question of, um, of, of just us. It's a question of art. What's happening to art? And let's discuss it. Let's talk about it. I mean, uh, and I just uh, sat down, I wrote a couple of postcards uh, to say to Edward Harper, to Ben Shan, to Yasko Niyoshi, to other artists of that type, and we began to gather where did you uh, first we, meet? Who attended? Uh, met, all the people uh, that you invited? We met uh, some kind of restaurant. Isn't it a restaurant? On the west side, yes. 
And uh, it was wonderful. I mean, we got to know one another. Henry Poor, uh, Harper, I mean, they were all, uh, Isabel Bishop, I mean, all these, some younger artists, they were younger then, uh, like uh, Jack Levine and uh, 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 many more who Many known, of these I artists think. who you invited you did not know before you came to meet with them. Many of the artists knew, did, not, did I, not know one I, another. I knew them, uh, some I knew, some I did not know too well. Uh, but uh, we got acquainted, so to speak, with one another, and we discussed art. We were not bitter. We were not uh, very uh, critical of what of the. I mean, in a personal way, we were not critical of these people, like uh, uh, well, uh, Jackson Pollock or Rothko or all these people. But we tried to understand what is happening to American art. And strangely enough, and then we this um, we came, uh, we began to publish a little magazine called Reality. And again, it was a kind of. And what was the purpose of Reality, and for uh, how long did it endure? It was actually a um, um, try it through our writing. I mean, the artists wrote; they decided to write. And declared with a manifesto that many and of them we signed. We had uh, some kind of a manifesto that. Uh, that uh, critics are not the only judges, or museums are not the only judges of art, that the artists themselves have an idea of what art is and so on. And we try to get together with the Museum of Modern Art and discuss the art situation or what's happening to art. It was all in a very civilized and uh, intelligent way. But you'd be sort of, uh, you really, it's impossible to describe the, um, the um, well, the, uh, Exasperation, uh, the, and the part of critics, how angry they became, or also the museums. The museums actually sent. The, yes, that we were accused of being communists in those days. Those were uh, were uh, were um, McCarthy time, McCarthy time, and uh, sooner or later, no matter Who what you do, you'd be accused of. Who accuses of us? The editor of uh, Art uh, News. And not only that, I mean, many people. They accused uh, me, uh, Kuniyoshi, I mean, who, and Edward Hopper, I mean, he was a very uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what he was. He was just, had great integrity, but I don't know what his polit politics were. Also Kuniyoshi and, uh, and the others, I mean. But they accused us of all, and they threatened us. They threatened us that they will, that they will, um, who threatened you? Again, uh, the art uh, magazines, and even the Museum of Modern Art. And some, uh, some people who were very anxious to be, be members of this group, of the reality group, seceded. They left the group because they got scared. Well, how did the Museum of Modern Art threaten you? I mean, what could they have done uh, since they, they weren't doing anything for you? Also, uh, something, the element of communism went in. <laughs> not to, to, uh, to somehow, not to get mixed up with uh, a move, with some kind of a movement. Kind and of. how did the group respond to that accusation? Well, the group responded beautifully, except that I said some people got scared and left the group. Who was that? Uh, well, I don't, should I mention names? Please. I can mention names. Well, uh, Ben Sean, who was the, one of the most eager people to, he, he wrote me a card. Oh, Raphael, sure, I'll, I'll come. It's about time that we should. And then the moment that we got this, uh, this um, uh, letter from the Museum of Modern Art, they sent it to me, by the way, with a, with a messenger, a uh, threatening letter, Ben Sean left it. And I got a telegram in the middle of the night for, from, from uh, Abe Ratner, that he doesn't want to have anything to do with it anymore since he heard from the Museum of Modern Art and so on. Well, what was the nature of the threat from the Museum of the Modern Art? As I Art? said, there was no threat, don't you? Uh, uh, the threat was that they will not be in the good graces of the Museum of Modern Art. And they so and to stated? to be in good graces of Modern Art was very important to a man like Ben Sean, very important to a man like uh, Abe Ratner, and to some other people. And it didn't but matter to, to you? Edward Hopper, it didn't matter. He was very... Maybe that's uh, why he's at the Whitney now. And very staunch, <laughs> and uh, he was what he was. It didn't matter to me. 
Do you think your career has suffered as a result of that? No, I don't think so. No, my art didn't suffer. Therefore, my career didn't suffer. The very time of your first exhibition in 1929 was the year of the founding of the Museum of Modern Art. Was that? The year of the founding yes. of the Museum of Modern Art. In its 50-year history, its focus has changed and evolved. And I wonder if you would comment, since you have been there from the beginning, as to the <coughs> original focus, its genesis, and its evolution, and the current status well, of the Museum of Modern Art. Well, I didn't follow it too well. I mean, I think all the museums have changed since, uh, since uh, I began to go to museums. You have no idea how the Metropolitan Museum changed. Well, give us how some the idea. Museum changed. How well, have when they I was at the very first time I came to, I was taken there by, by a cousin of mine. To the, I was about 14 years old. It was filled with Masonniers, with Jeromes, with um, all sorts of that kind of painting. Well, it's a, and, and the American paintings were nothing but pictures of pretty women with flowers or pretty women telling story, reading fairy tales to their children. That the kind of pictures were at the Metropolitan Museum in those days. But it has changed greatly. I think in my book I say that I grew, I developed together with the Metropolitan Museum. Because uh, since I was 16 years old, I'd go to the Metropolitan Museum up till now. And uh, we, I have changed, the museum has cha uh, changed, and the Whitney uh, Museum changed, and the Museum of Modern Art changed. All these museums uh, put on wonderful exhibitions uh, at one time or another. I mean, I've, uh, I've seen the first exhibitions of Sutin, Kokoshka, uh, uh, in the Museum of Modern Art. I've learned a great deal. And the um, Metropolitan Museum put on, I think the very first Eakins exhibition I saw at the Metropolitan Museum. That was many, many years ago. And uh, uh, museums is, uh, I learned a great deal in museums, and I am a museum fiend. You mentioned that in the course of your career, you have changed as well. Is that your technique, your point of view, your state of mind? What has changed, and how I has say, it changed? No, I say that that's, uh, I said I hope it's changed. I, I say it in, uh, in the context of what I'm saying in the book, I, uh, well, I saw an exhibition, say, in, v in Vienna. It was called, I still remember the name, Polaritet, or whatever it means. The exhibition was called Polaritet, and it had paintings, beginning with Delacroix, till I think they had one American painting, is by, um, by the Kooning. Well, oh no, that was in, uh, was it in Holland? I don't remember now. Whatever. There was a painting, a couple of paintings by the abstract expressionists. No, no realistic American painting, no, no representational American painting. And uh, I kind of, uh, and I say there, when I see an exhibition like that, I, I, I question where do I belong? My painting wasn't there, of course. Where do I belong in the, in the, in the field, of, in the world of art? My paintings are not seen in such exhibitions. They're not seen in the exhibitions in Rio de Janeiro or in, in uh, Venice, uh, by Sao Paulo or those, Venice, uh, the Biennale. They're not seen in those empty, uh, huge uh, exhibitions. And I question, where does my, where do I belong? And I say there that I, I have changed Certainly, uh, my work is of today. My work is of today because I live today. I, I um, well, I am a product of the aesthetics of today, of the life of today, and uh, of the art of today, and so on. And and I and I do and I do hope that my work does reflect. Uh, the spirit of today, or as, as it should, that one uh, that although I'm not an abstract expressionist, and uh, I'm not a um, 
uh, all those, uh, I don't belong to any of those easels. But nevertheless, I hope that my work does express the spirit of our time, of our time. And, um, uh, and then I say that, uh, uh, and I hope that I, uh, I am myself, I'm not influenced by all these isms, by all this, uh, by all this abstraction. Not, uh, uh, um, let's see now, I, I can't recall it now. I In said terms it was, of what it was, was my own choice. And, uh, and I said to myself. Did you ever ex experiment uh, with that new wave uh, of discovery? I just, I just want Please. to finish it. And uh, when, uh, um, and when I said, to be an artist of today, one has to be an express, a, an abstract expressionist or an abs a non-representationalist. Then I choose not to be an artist of today. Uh, didn't, and I quote Ang there, uh, saying uh, to his detractors, that he said, they say I'm not of this century. They were accusing him that he was not of their century, of his century. He said, if I don't like my century art-wise, must I belong to my century? And I say that about myself. If, I, if that is the art of this, this century, I would rather not belong to my century. You see? And I paint the way I paint. When Whether abstract expressionism was a new wave of discovery, did it ever occur to you to experiment in that fashion, to work from your imagination? A new wave of discovery? At that point it was, surely. In uh, the 1950s, did it ever occur to you to experiment with abstract expressionism? Oh, to experiment? Experiment? No, it, it wasn't too much of a challenge for me. Because I know, uh, they, as I said before, these uh, abstract expressionists, I knew them all. They were my um, contemporaries. And uh, I knew what they were before they became abstract expressionists. What were they? And what were they? They were kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, not uh, geniuses, mm -hmm. to say they, uh, to be polite, you know. They were kind of, uh, some of them were a little mediocre. -ish. I knew them all. I liked them all as people. I knew especially Arshel Gorky, whom I liked very much. And I think that he was probably the most poetic of them. He had a certain beautiful quality in his, in, uh, in his uh, earlier work, uh, no matter whom he uh, emulated. <coughs> but there's always this element of Arshel Gorky in all his paintings. I always defended him. And uh, I just um, deplore the fact that he finally became an abstract expressionist. Are there more and more people that are accepting representational art today? Well, I don't, <coughs> I really don't know. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I don't know. Are there? Maybe. But I that mean, doesn't people, affect your work. I think that uh, some young artists became a kind of sick and tired of what was going on, and they're trying very hard to get back to representationalism. But they have lost a lot of time, and uh, it tells, it, it shows, that um, it'll take a little while, that <coughs> if it goes on, if that trend goes on, <coughs> it'll take a little while for them to, um, for art to uh, redevelop again. I have my, um, but that's too much to go into. Do you think that profound, thematic, contemplative painting is something that is becoming extinct? What is it? That profound, contemplative painting oh. is something that is becoming extinct? It shouldn't. I don't know. <coughs> well, that, that, well, that's uh, it's, uh, too much of a question. I think what is really the problem, uh, the problem is, is, is that to really try to understand what's taking place in art today is that uh, what the artist used to do, what was expected of the artist to do, is done technologically today. At one time, a person went to Van Eyck or Van Dyck and said, do my portrait. Now they can go to the photographer. When the inauguration of Napoleon took place, <coughs> David painted this great painting in the Louvre. 
today inauguration of a president takes place. There is the cameras, there is television, there is the, uh, everything else, but not the artist. When, when the war in Vietnam took place, at one time, artists would go the, uh, and make drawings, like Winslow Homer and, uh, during the Civil War and so on. Today, there no, nobody but the photographer. In other words, the artists, I mean, uh, our society, uh, uh, technological society, can do without an artist. An artist is not needed in our society. And therefore, I think the artist lost the, um, his function, I mean, and he doesn't know what to do with himself. Is there anything that you haven't painted that you would like to? Well, I would like to paint the, the uh, Supreme Court. The justices like, like, of the Supreme Court? Yes, like, like uh, Franz Hals painted those huge paintings. Why not? would be wonderful. But actually, what you just said is but what is impossible. happening in the State Department. There are no longer portraits that are commissioned, but yeah, yeah. major, and then the Defense Department as well, but major photographic studies. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's um, our society can do without artists. Among your works, who was your favorite subject? Your wife excluded, of course. Uh, my work? Well, I don't know. I still like some of my early paintings that I did in the Depression days. And uh, I, well, I, I like some of the paintings I did recently. I like the paintings I'm doing today, sometimes. <laughs> I don't How do you know when a painting is finished? I really don't know. That's, that's a problem, you know. Some, uh, at times I uh, overdo a painting. I, do, I work too much on a painting and uh, I uh, lose the initial quality, the, um, the initial quality of promise, of spontaneity. I noticed that you were wearing a decoration, one that was recently given to you. Not recently, I've had it a long time. I'm, that is years. not the national... That's a member, I'm a member of the Institute of Arts and Letters, of the Institute and the Academy of Arts and Letters. That's the uh, institute where, or the academy, where uh, um, writers the and painters belong. And Actually, I was thinking of your recent honor, well, that the was, National uh, Arts Club. Uh, that was, I got some kind of a gold medal, yes. In fact, the number of people that were present uh, reveal the wide range of your friendships, and some of them appear in your canvases. And you may be conservative in your choice of painters by contemporary standards, but surely you are not in your choice of writers. Why do you not apply the same standards to experimental writers as you do to experimental painters? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, writers make, make more sense than the, uh, the experimental writers make more sense than the experimental painters. Because, uh, uh, I don't know, I haven't seen just a blank page and say this is piece of literature, but I saw a blank canvas and say this is a work of art. Did you ever expect your life and your work to unfold the way it has? To? Did I, I expect? Yes, I had the vague um, kind of um, perceptions or vague hopes, I don't know just what. I always wanted to be an artist. You work from early in the morning till dusk on a Not daily basis. Not early. I mean, I'm there about 9.30 and I work till about 5 o'clock. But a lot of time is taken by washing brushes, cleaning the palette. And you stretch your own canvases? Uh, once in a, not, not always, no. I just restretched the big canvas because I had to restretch it. What can we expect from you in the future? The same thing. Uh, more of the same, but well, we all look forward to that with considerable interest and delight. And thank you very much thank for you. being with us, Raphael Sawyer. Thank and thank you, audience. You. you see, you are Russian. You are Russian, applauding. In return, you applaud the audience. Well, that's a nice, nice thing to do. Yes. Actually. And now it is time for the class to join in the conversation. If you have a question, won't you please raise your hand? And if you care to, identify yourself by name as well. The man in the center. Uh, what do you
feel are continuing the traditions that you've set forth.